Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Star Book Talk. I am Saran Jumbari, editor of Daily Star Books. And our guest today is someone very, very beloved by her readers, by her fellow writers, and everyone in the social media world of books. Um, Farah Ghaznavi is an author, a translator, and a development worker. She has been a regular columnist at the Daily Star for many years. She has edited Lifelines, an anthology published by Zuban Books. And she has written Fragments of River Song, a short story collection that we published from the Daily Star Books in 2013. Um, now, Fragments is actually a quite old book, but it has sort of come back alive um, over the past few weeks, thanks to the readers on Bookstagram. And that's why we're here, by popular demand, to talk about Fragments and to talk about books and the craft of writing. So let's bring her on, Farah Ghaznavi. Thank you, Farah Appa, for making time for us. And it's so lovely to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Sarah, for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and I think a lot of people know it was it was your birthday. I'm, actually, I'm not sure if I was supposed to mention that, <laughs> but um, a very related happy birthday. Thank you very much. It was a good birthday. I had a lot of messages and it didn't feel as bad to have a pandemic birthday as I'd expected. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, so I'd love to start talking about your book. Now, we've, we've talked about this before. The first thing that kind of struck me about reading fragments is something that you write in your in your introduction and you talk about it when we when we're talking to each other as well that stories kind of take birth inside your head and what you want to do is set them off into the world can you tell us about this process how how they germinate in your head how they evolve and how you bring it out into the on pages well, I think to the to end, uh, sorry, to begin with the ending, I bring it out on pages with great angst and difficulty. But um, the process itself, it's a little mysterious, actually, to be honest, even for me. And I try not to, I have a bad habit, habit of overthinking everything, so I try not to overthink the process. Essentially, it's as though I basically get an idea. You know, it's like, it can come from anything, <clears throat> something I've seen, something, I've, something I'm watching, um, and I just get a a germ of an idea which kind of comes quite quickly and says, oh, wouldn't this be interesting? What would this story be? And for me, usually it's very character driven. Like I begin with the protagonist um, and what he or she is thinking or seeing or feeling and very quickly sort of, and often the other, uh, the other thing I have, which is a bit strange is that I have the ending. So I have the idea and I have the ending and then I go back to it. And that's where the protagonist's role begins to tell me how the idea got to that ending. I think that's the closest I could come to summing it up. Um, but the, the fun thing was, I used to hear writers saying this a lot. I honestly was a skeptic. But um, what can happen, I tend to leave it to, to the characters. I just, what's important to me is that you have like headspace to think about it. Because I think we talk a lot about writing. You know, how many words do you write? How often do you write? Yeah. But I think a huge part of the process, and probably not, not just for me, is about thinking. You know, like, who are these characters? What is going to happen? And so on and so forth. So at least a solid 40% of the work is the planning of the story for me. And I don't mean necessarily outlining, but just working it out. And um, and then when I think I have a, a rough idea of what's going to happen, I sit down and write. I don't do detailed outlines, but I do, you know, basic outlines. And then that's where the fun really begins, because as I was saying, Often I've been taken completely off track by something a character does, or I'm looking at this and then I'm thinking, but what if, you know, and it, and it goes off in a very different direction from the outline. And I have learned now after some trial and error to just let it go and follow and see where it ends up. And very often where it ends up is not what was in the first outline, but ends up being a more, more sort of satisfactory uh, outcome in that sense. Even for me, I feel like this is the story that wanted to be told, even if it wasn't the story that initially came to me. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's a rough summing yeah. up of it. Do you ever have conversations with these characters in your head when, when you're trying to take them somewhere, but they don't want to go there? Yeah, well, usually I feel a little bit like uh, I'm watching them. It's a bit like watching a movie. Mm -hmm. And if something really isn't made, like I can, I'm frustrated because I can see that this is where the story needs to go, but I don't know how to get it there. Then I will mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, there's this trick, which often works for me at least, where I'm getting ready for bed and I just have a very quick think through 
of where I am and where I'm stuck. And then that is when I have the conversation with the character and say, you know, can you please, you know, just make up your mind and let me know where <laughs> we're going with this, you know? And often either sometime in the early hours or after I wake up, something will have come to me. So I think it's just your subconscious basically helping you out, but it's a good, it's a good technique I've found. So yeah, I do have uh, conversations with characters. I try not to do it publicly because, you know, there are enough, enough worries about, um, <laughs> Hearing yeah. voices in your head without adding yeah. to it, but yeah, um, it's very it's strange because you can almost hear hear them fully formed having these conversations. I'm sure a lot of editing also goes into it, which we'll talk about later. Um, I actually wanted to remind our viewers at this point: if you have any questions or comments for the author or for about this conversation, please you can type it in into the comment box, and we'll try to address them. Um, now you have a lot of you have had a lot of influential and creative women in your family you know you um i didn't know this myself it was it was so wonderful to find out that you uh, you're related to begum rokia who doesn't need any introduction and your mother is also such such an iconic figure in the you know cultural world of bangladesh can you tell us how your writing journey started and why you know what inspired you to start writing and and to start loving books so much I think loving books basically came from both my parents. My father is a voracious reader and uh, he never, you know, it's funny because I think parents often try to guide their children's reading. So he never did that. He's always been like, um, you know, read what you want. So when I was reading Marvel comics, X-Men, uh, that was fine with him. When I was reading these dreadful Mills and Boone romances, that was fine with him as long as I was reading. Um, and I think that really helped because, because it just meant I was exposed to a lot of different things, including my parents books, which are, you know, our whole house is full of them, basically. Um, so that's where it's, I can't remember a time when I didn't love reading. I think that's the basic. Okay. And I, and, and also I was read to as a child, which I think is a wonderful thing for a parent to do. Uh, my father used to read me bedtime stories. And that that was a very good, uh, you know, way of keeping my interest even before I read well myself. Um, so it started with that. And I think I, I admired writers growing up, like it was, they were like rock stars to me, you know, this idea that you could create something that goes out into the world and someone else reads it and then they think it's just for them you know or at least yeah. i felt a story like wind in the willows was just for me so you know it was it was a magical thing for me i never actually thought i i could be a writer so i never aspired to it and then i think from a very young age i was writing um doggerel just strange bits of poetry and then in my teens some very dreadful poetry which we shan't talk about and um after that i decided that i couldn't write fiction but maybe I could write nonfiction. And that's when my relationship with the Daily Star began because I was first writing, contributing to a Dhaka Day by Day. And then I got my own column, Food for Thought. But I was still convinced I couldn't write um, fiction. And it was a self, you know, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. And then there was an incident where Daily Star had a headline about a child who was beaten very badly by her employer who died in hospital. Her name was Rupali and she was 10. And it just horrified me so badly. I spoke to Asha Amin about it and said, you know, can the magazine get one of the fiction writers to write something from the child's point of view? And so we discussed it, I put it aside. And then three days later, I sat down and I wrote my first short story, which was called A Small Sacrifice and is based on Rupali. So that, and, and I think my anger and my sadness basically broke through my self-doubt. So then I thought, well, if I can write one short story, perhaps I can write more. And that's how it began really. Um, as for the people in my family, I think I, it's it's almost scary to mention them because because some of them are so um, so very distinguished. My great grandmother um, Karimuna Sakhanam was the older sister of Ibrahim Sabir and uh, Rokia, and in fact Rokia dedicates I think Sultana's dream to her for for teaching her English. And uh, Karimunasa herself was one of I think believed to be the first female Muslim poet uh, in what was then Bengal. So there's her, there's her younger sister, Rukia. And on my mother's side, that's on my father's side. And on, on my mother's side, there was uh, Akhtar Mahal, who died very young and published two novels, I think. One of which has the very interesting title of Neon Trita. So uh, it perhaps says something about who she was. Um, yeah, so a lot to live up to if I look at it, but I don't. I'm just writing my little stories and, and getting on with it, you know. But I'm very proud. I'm very proud of that uh, literary heritage in my family. And, I, and like you, I found out very late. 2005, mm -hmm. Niaz Zaman published a story, that first story, Small Sacrifice, in a book. And the, that was the last story in 2005. 1905, she 
she used Sultana's dream. So that was the first story and mine was the last. And my father said, oh, how lovely, look, it's your great gra uh, grand aunt beginning the book and you at the end, I'm like, wait, 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 that's Begum Brokea, you know, uh, who are you talking about? <laughs> So anyway, very embarrassing. I got a lecture about, uh, you know, the lack of respect for history, but uh, it was a nice way to find out. That, that is such a wonderful origin story. Um, and I completely agree about, you know, when you're writing or even when you're reading, you're, you're in your head. And it's, I was actually reading an essay about this yesterday. Um, there's this wonderful book called Blueberries by um, Elena Savage, I think, if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it correctly. So she writes about MFA tracks and uh, she, she writes about a lot of things. But in that particular essay, she was talking about how a book is for so many people. But when I'm reading it, it is just for me. And, exactly. you know, it's and there's nothing that parallels that experience. Um, I want to talk about your choice of narrators, which I think is very interesting. Um, yeah, I'll just let you go ahead with it because I wanted to talk about the child narrators and everything. But can you tell us about how you choose which point of view to tell the story from? I don't choose. <laughs> it's the That's what I was saying earlier, that it's the protagonist who really decides for me. And the story comes in that way. It comes from a point of view. So I ha that's not really something I've had to agonize over much. I know a lot of people worry about it. Perhaps I will at some future date. But to date, at least, the story comes because it comes in the voice of the narrator, you see? So that decides automatically where the point of view is. But um, I have had, I had one interesting experience actually with a book, with a, uh, there was a book that came out in 2020 called The Best Asian Short Stories 2020. Yeah. And there's a story called Saving Grace. This hasn't reached Bangladesh uh, audiences yet, I think. But in that story, I had written the story from the point of view of a, a young Filipino man. Please don't ask me why this is what came, uh, working in a hotel in the Middle East. And um, I wrote the story in one of my beta readers, uh, because I have this group of eight beta readers who I rely on very, very uh, heavily. One of my beta readers wrote back and said, oh, this was very interesting, but wouldn't it be fascinating if, if we could also hear the point of view of the woman in the story, because we only get Benny's point of view. And I thought, oh, no. And she said, no, I'm not telling you to write it. I'm just saying it would be interesting. And, and then, of course, it kind of captured my imagination. So the second half of the story is written in the voice of the woman narrator. And uh, so that was one case where it, it didn't change, but it, it was augmented, certainly. Um, but otherwise, it's usually just, as I said, whoever, whoever tells me the story gets to be the protagonist. Have you ever felt like you um, chose the wrong narrator for a story? Or when you revisited it after the story mm -hmm. was published, did you feel like someone else needed to tell that story? Not yet. The, the case where I felt that someone else needed to tell that story was Saving Grace because right. it made a huge difference. Uh, Benny is actually a little bit obsessed with this, um, with this one of his colleagues. So you hear it from his point of view, where he's, of course, justifying himself, and then you hear it from her point of view. And neither of them, are, they're both very flawed characters, the woman also, but differently flawed, if that makes sense. So you get a more rounded version. But... Um, that's quite a scary thought to have written or published a story and then want to change. Thanks for nothing, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. I hope it won't. Fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely. Um, but you mentioned your your child narrators. This is something that I find very interesting in most of your stories. They're, the narrator is either someone very young or they're looking back um, upon their days of youth. And are you consciously... Do you have a soft spot for you know younger narrators, or do you have a reason why you make that decision? I think both. I have a soft spot for children, and I have uh, a reason also. But again, it's not something I could do if it didn't come organically. So I think one of the things is I think, um, and you know, if you think back to your own childhood, I'm sure you will also understand. I think children see a lot of things which adults don't think that they see. Yeah. And I think children see things differently also. They're not always correct in their um, estimate of something, but they have a point of view. And their point of view tends not to be contaminated by more adult concerns of loke ki bolbe, but somebody right. ki bhabbe. But, you know, it's, it's like a very, whether it's right or wrong, their response, uh, accurate, or sorry, rather than right or wrong, whether it's accurate or not, is not the point. The point is you're getting a very unfiltered, a very genuine kind of feeling from them. So I think I... I admire that, and I think it's not perhaps always appreciated how much children see and how much children think. 
And I think also in cultures like ours, but not only ours, there is also danger that adults don't listen very much to children. So I think I do feel um, child protection, for example, is an issue that's very close to my heart. I think perhaps you've read Escaping the Mirror and yes. it's come up in one or two others. And I think uh, there are so many stories I've heard of things that happen to young kids. I'm sure you've heard more than your fair share. And, and still it goes on and still, you know, people will say that, oh, I tried to explain to my aunt, my mother, my grandfather, whoever, and they didn't understand or they didn't believe me. And I think that's a terrible thing, you know, because it's not just what happens, but it's also what happens after that. The, the la loss of faith in your parents or loss of faith in your siblings or whoever it was that you tried to explain and then you carry it for the rest of your life. And if that can be, if those incidences can be reduced, I think that would be a marvelous thing. It's a global phenomenon. I feel that, you know, um, child abuse is one of those things that cuts across not just social class or, you know, any one community, but but globally, the places where you see it occurring less is probably where places where there are strong penalties in place, sadly, you know, rather than they're not there, they are there. They're just figuring out how to do, how to manage. So I think that's one of my major concerns is I, I feel very much for kids. And um, I think if you read a, an essay, there's a wonderful essay by Anne Lamott called the overly, it's called either the oversensitive child or the overly sensitive child. And I read that essay and I thought, oh my God, it's me. Because I remember things at five, at, at younger than five, and remember thinking about the way adults behaved around me. And they seem to have no idea <laughs> what I was thinking or that I was thinking these things. So in a, in a way, I think I, I want to give voice to children, and but also more to the, the principal issues. The children should be listened to, children should be protected. And if even if they've got something wrong, then we should be able to explain to them where they've got it wrong, rather than just dismissing them. As to me, but not to me, on a choto, you know, right? But Omar, at a kisha costo, which exactly, exactly. But we can know, we uncle, but auntie, but omuke potion. Why don't you like these people? Why can't you be nice? I wonder yeah. how many times we've heard that just be nice, you know, whereas yeah. you, you might have a very good instinctive feeling for why do you, you don't like someone, and it doesn't have to be a terrible reason, it can just be that you don't like them. So then you shouldn't be forced to sit on their lap or hug them or kiss them or. Be nice, you know, be polite, yeah. I think is good enough. Be polite. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a bit of a follow up question. This is just occurring to me now. Um, you have an interesting relationship with your narrators, but I also think you make very interesting choices of space. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of a mosquito net. That's, you know, just something about being inside a moshari inspires mm -hmm. intimacy, inspires honesty. And then we have the guava tree. And so, you know, you make all these really interesting choices with space. Can you tell us about how you make these decisions? I think um, it's more just an idea comes to me in a way. Perhaps I, I've been in a mosquito net, of course. I've climbed guava trees in my time. And so I have those. I think it's from memory because I have I was just thinking about this today. I have this very interesting or rather very weird quirk of my brain, which is that I often when I'm just thinking, I remember places and I don't know why, because these places aren't always significant at all. I remember places where I've been just a couple of times or I remember other people's houses that I visited as a child and I will suddenly have a vision of that space. So I think I have some interest in spaces as well as people, if that makes sense. And then mm -hmm. when I'm writing something, the, it's a very good point, actually, that the, the space also comes to me with the narrator and the story. I don't consciously think, where will I set this? You know, it kind of comes as part of the bigger picture bigger picture like the hotel like the guava tree like the mosquito net and i think yeah. you know there is something about when you don't know people very well or you're stuck in a situation where you won't know them for very long you know a travel companion or you're just traveling somewhere to you will talk you may talk to that person about something in the comfort of knowing you'll never see them again it's Absolutely. less today with the social media world but even so you know so i think those kind of situations sometimes bring about um it's not a false intimacy but a temporary intimacy if you will, that allows for certain things to, to be discussed, which would not never be otherwise discussed. And so sometimes maybe I'm all the more special for yeah. that, just because. Yes, we'll very much so. It's a moment in time. It's a moment in time. Yes. So you want to capture that. Um, with that story in particular, I thought it was so interesting because you have you have all these frames in your story. You know, you have the Moshari and you also have the camp and then you have the trip and you know this, this location where none of them have ever been to before and so i, I thought it was very interesting uh we have a question from our audience our 
very beloved Ronnie uh, Astar sir, Astar Ronnie Two Three. He's he's a columnist for Shout, and he writes for me um, very often. So he's asking us a query regarding your children characters. Are you influenced by Roald Dahl's children characters, where where children see the world with no knowledge of adult constraints? That's a really interesting question. I don't know if I would specifically say I was influenced by Roald Dahl, but Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was one of my favorite stories. So he's one of the he's one of the softer narrators in a way. And I love Matilda as well, who is perhaps falls in more into the category that you're talking about. I think yes, I think probably a lot of the stories that I read as a child, because I read a lot as a child, were um, you know were about children who who have a very particular view of the world and who don't let the, their adult surroundings kind of shape their worldview to the same extent. I was actually quite a do docile child. I think my parents will um, <laughs> will agree to this. So it, it's, I think I had an inner rebel, if you will, rather than uh, something. But I had a very strong sense of justice and a very strong belief that what I was seeing was what I was seeing, whether or not anybody else was seeing that. In fact, that's something that comes up uh, again in, a, it's in the Golden Anthology. There's a story called What My Parents yes. Never Told Me. And again, that, that draws on various people's experiences of convent school, not only mine, um, but it's that idea of, of how, how you see the world and how others, especially adults around you, don't see it. So yeah, I think, I think Matilda can definitely be given part of the credit for that perspective. And I'm sure there are others. Um, and it's interesting that it's something I noticed in, in your story for Golden as well, you talk about the books that these children are reading and they're not supposed to be reading which I think happens in one of the stories and fragments as well. I can't remember which one, um, but it's, it was a lot of fun. Oh, yes, me. it's Guava Tree Rebellion. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All the books that the girls aren't supposed yeah. to be reading. Uh, oh. do, you, do you have any favorite, other than Matilda and Charlie in the Chocolate Country, do you have any favorite childhood books or characters? I loved, um, loved C.S. Lewis's Narnia. Uh, it's not a trilogy, yeah. you know, the, the series. I love that very, very much. I loved Harry Potter, which came later, but I love it very, very much. I would go as far as to say I'm a Potterhead. And um, I love The Wind in the Willows. And um, yeah, I think, I, 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 you know, we could actually have an entire session on children's yeah. books, I think, because there are so many that, that really kind of spoke to me. And, and they just take you somewhere where it doesn't really matter. You know, um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, uh, you know, Narnia is there for all of us, whether we're sitting in Bangladesh or whether we're, you know, in in oxfordshire it works just as well so i think um yeah many many books but those think, those would be yeah. some to start with sorry go ahead children's books i think also leave such a huge impression i'm thinking about how to this day i think i got most of my general knowledge from the princess diaries books everything from science to geography to you know just general iq i learned from from the princess diaries books and they really stay with you um mm. I'd like to talk about your process of editing at this point. How much do you change your stories and you know, how do you go about editing them? Okay, so my process of editing is hideously painstaking, I think, in brief. And I, you know, I think it's dangerous to be a perfectionist with writing because it's never going to be perfect and your definition of perfect may not be somebody else's anyway. So I try to some extent to let the story go when it's um, adequate, for want of a better word, but, but it, it needs to be at least you know, bearable before I'm gonna send it out for submission. So the beta readers have had to be hard at work on that, um, pointing out the various flaws and hopefully the plus points as well. But um, for uh, afterwards, you know, I, I'm a very, very bad example to emulate for editing because I agonize over it. And I think it's because I've been an editor myself. Yes. So I'm, I'm very, very critical when it comes to editing. And so what happens is, for example, if you take a story like um, Getting There, which has now, um, I've been very fortunate because people usually don't want to republish a story. They want new material. Um, but Getting There has been published now five times in the UK, US, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and India. And each time, and it's the 20, probably the version that you read now is the 25th iteration of that story, the 25th draft, right? And the terrible thing is probably if you give me that story today, I will still be able to find at least four or five things to fix. You know, fix. But it's been out in the world. So I think with editing what i would say is like um make sure that it's up to your standard on that day make it the best that you're capable of i have very little um 
I don't respect people who don't put out their best work. You know, you're always evolving as a writer. And I think that's fair enough. What, how you will view a story that you wrote two years ago, even, let alone 10 years ago, is very different today um, if you're growing fast. But I think uh, there is no excuse for sending half finished work or anything less than your best. Let it be your best on the day. And that way, at least, it's also your best chance of getting accepted because an editor mm -hmm. or you know, a publisher is not interested in the fact that you were sick and tired of doing, you know, doing the 24th draft of it. They're not interested. Yeah. They're just going to look at it as the first first and final version they're looking at. So I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, who are who are sending out work now, I would really humbly request, please make sure for your own sake, for your chances of success, that it's really good work. And also as a principle, you know, as a as a principle for yourself, set your goals high. And if you even if you don't meet them, you'll you know, it'll be better than it might have been otherwise. I think it's also about evolving as a reader because, you know, um, especially if it's if it's a story that you think is finished and so you have that mm -hmm. respect for it, um, you might feel differently or you might notice different things or resonate with different things each time that you come to it, depending on the mood that you're in or the headspace that you're in. Yeah. Um, I mean, this have is... A... Sorry, no, Sorry. please go ahead. No, I was just going to say, this is what I meant by, you know, for me each time a reader likes a story, what they've read, what they've taken from it, that's entirely individual. For me as a writer, it's fascinating to get to hear that. I feel very privileged. And sometimes I listen and I think, wow, that's not what I intended at all. But it's still, you know, each person is kind of re reading through their own prism and their own experiences and their own feelings. So I have a lot of respect for it. And I also find it really, really interesting. Sorry. Do you on. remember that story that you sent to me? And it turns out that I've it was very creepy how like I'd lived through those exact experiences and it was it was so scary for me to read it. Um, it. It felt like you'd, you know, been inside my head and written down everything I'd witnessed. So it's crazy how, you know, if, even if it's strangers, even if the writer mm. is lived a hundred years before you, things can, yes. things can yeah. overlap. Um, yeah, I had it. Been, sorry. Um, we have, after we after. have two questions, but. Um, sure. I'll let you continue. You were about to say something. You no, know, I'll come. I'll, I was just going to come back to a couple of examples of, of readers who came up with interesting things, but that can that can wait, or we can okay. skip it. Let's go to the questions. Uh, so Zareen Alam, we know her. You know her. Um, she Zareen, has a question yeah. for us. Do you think of styles, that is, in terms of social realism, magic realism, etc., when you craft or plan your stories? Mm. So the easy answer is no. <laughs> I write the stories as best I can, and to me, that's why you know if people say it's it's literary fiction or it's, um, you know, lyrical or whatever. That to me is a very, you know, again, we're coming back to what the writer takes from it. For me, what I'm, my aim is to try and tell the story as well as I can. And that would be whatever form it takes it in. So for example, I think more than form, I would say for genre, um, you know, the assessment is basically science fiction, which I've never written before or since, but I'm toying with something now. Um, mm -hmm. But I, the one thing I would say is I'm very open to, um, I'm open to trying new things because I do believe sometimes very interesting things happen when you're outside of your comfort zone, you know, like, so if I want to write a poem, which shockingly enough, I recently did, I said shockingly because it's not my area, um, I'll write it. You know, if I want to write a piece of science fiction, I'll write it. I'll see how it turns out. That's what the betas are there for. They'll tell me if it's terrible and then I'll hide it in a drawer somewhere so nobody ever sees it. <laughs> but um, so I, I have done, uh, you know, like more recently, a couple of years ago, I, I tried writing 100 word stories because and that was great fun because it's such a tight form you know you cannot waste a single word and Kamrul mm -hmm. Hassan was bringing out the, uh, the haiku writer was bringing out a book and so he asked me for for some submissions and I thought 100 words how can you write a story like that and I got so into it I wrote eight so okay. you know I think I think you can learn something from trying new things it sounds a bit obvious but what I mean is you can learn something by trying anything you know whether mm -hmm. it works or it doesn't so I haven't um I haven't uh, sort of thought of styles as such, but I'm aware that there are some very, I like, I have this terrible fear that my stories are very different from each other. So I ask everyone who reads Fragments of River Song, I'm like, whether you like the story or not, please take a break before you read the next one, because chances are they won't be similar. Um, and so, you know, for example, Old Delhi New Tricks is basically quite a light humorous piece in theory. Mm -hmm. It has underlying undertones, but it's a, it's a light piece. Escaping the Mirror is a story I don't like rereading because I find it painful to read. Um, so, you know, I, I think 
the in a way the story to some extent generates its own style there are some things that lend itself to humor or you know um lightheartedness and then there are others which are more satirical and others which are you know more sort of more of a like a heartfelt story that you're telling a reader um and those those are decided by the stories but i don't um and i mean in terms of style i think some people might say that some of my stories are social realism but they're not intentionally so they're stories about characters and that's the context may determine where it goes magical realism i would never dare that's one <laughs> that's one Very style I, I i am terrified i can't even read it properly i sit there going why does everybody say this is brilliant i don't understand what they mean <laughs> so yeah so that one i i definitely stay clear of um we're getting a lot of great questions but before that i wanted to ask you about your beta readers do we get to should i ask who they are do we get to know about their identities or oh. it's fine if you don't want to divulge no no that. it's okay i do, i i should have just asked permission from them i think some of them won't no, mind that's totally some fine but my parents uh, my parents are actually my first beta readers so the first draft of a story goes to them and although anybody who knows them will tell you that they're very nice people they are remarkably brutal beta readers so <laughs> my dad would say something like yeah no this didn't really work for me and i'm like why and he's like i don't know i just didn't really didn't really care and you're oh like God, it's two weeks of my life <laughs> how can you not care you know he's like, no no i didn't mean that i didn't mean that but you know he's like the softest person but he doesn't pull his punches when it comes to this and my mom is more she's more detail oriented so she said nakito kano eta bollo amar to mone hoy na eta realistic you know or you need to shorten it or it doesn't flow right so you know i get my first slapping from them and then the rest of my beta readers are very gentle actually no i'm kidding they 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 differ that one of the most wonderful people who's one of my beta readers and i really recommend if anyone likes short stories or even actually novels because she writes novels is madhulika little who is an indian writer and she's got this brilliant book of short stories called my lawfully wedded husband and other stories and it's she's a incredibly nice person and they are incredibly funny and black stories so anyone who likes roll dal this is someone to check out okay. so she's she's a brilliant beta reader and our our um, aesthetic is very similar so i really can can use it a lot and then there's one of my ex interns adiba who's living in australia now and another one who's in the states and uh, they they send it back so usually the good thing about that is at any hour i can usually find one beta reader um who's available and i have a few in dhaka as well my current intern namira is also a very very a very good beta reader so yeah but i don't know what i am i'm one of those people who's very bad at judging my own work so when i wrote uh, big mother it was written in over a year in three sets because that was a very bad year and i was having difficulty finding writing time so when i finally finished it that night i finished it i thought oh given that it's been written over a year and it's quite a complicated story it's not bad and i sent it off to the beta readers and then i woke up the next morning i thought it's trash it's atrocious how could i have sent it off and fortunately for me three of them responded immediately bringing up some of the things that needed to be addressed but also overall liking the story so uh, for me it's very important because i trust their judgment and i know they'll tell me the truth and then my own judgment which i don't always trust um basically is overridden in that sense i wouldn't have sent it to them if it wasn't in some shape but i don't know you know beyond that it's it's very heavily dependent on them so a huge thank you goes out to all of them actually one or two of them might even be watching this so i'm sure they are especially if they're in bangladesh um mm -hmm. i know a few people from abroad might not be able to make it right now uh we have a question from tasneem of bookcentric who does who is doing mm -hmm. such amazing work with amazing work yeah, amazing i i love bookcentric mm -hmm. Um yeah, so Tasneem is asking us do you think making movies out of books especially for children takes away the pleasure or interest for the children um do you think they don't want to go back and read the book in that case my feeling would always be to give them the book first to be honest because there are very few books very few movies that i've seen which i feel do justice to the book very few i mean i can i can count them on the fingers of one hand that's just my opinion so i would prefer them to read the book with an open mind and then they can see because the movie adaptation is inevitably because of the format will will leave out so much you know yeah. look at the harry potter books i love the harry potter movies i think they've actually done a really good job and i've watched them more than once but i wouldn't because kids also nowadays are so um so screen driven in that sense mm -hmm. that i think losing um losing the habit of reading is a terrible thing because you know for parents who say to me well you know i allow them to use the ipad for x hours a day because they get bored and then they bother me i'm like teach them how to read a book they'll never bother you 
really just we'll make sure they, have the yeah. they will never i never bothered my yeah. parents i was just like can i have another book you know and then that was that so i think even from a purely self-interested point of view teach them to read and you know get them if they can to love reading and you will make your own life so much simpler really so yeah, yeah. sorry quick, quick i think it there. stays with you forever you know it's, it's a oh, it foolproof plan against loneliness and boredom you're never exactly. bored in the doctor's reception yeah. you're never bored anywhere <laughs> no exactly um we have a somewhat related question so i think we can take it now morsalin masaddeq he writes for us regularly um he's asking us what has happened to the culture of reading stories to children before the parents tuck them to bed at night do you think it's declining and what about you was that a part of your childhood you've mentioned that it was mm-hmm. or did you read stories to the children in your life um this is actually very uh, an, a lovely question i'm so glad you asked it because i think the culture of reading to kids at bedtime is not um it's not dead but it feels like it's declining i have friends who make a point of reading to their kids and every one of them has said to me that apart from the fact that the child is is enjoying the story and doing something with the parent it's a really good bonding experience between the parent mm-hmm. and child and i think that's that's it's worth doing for that alone in addition to that you're exposing your kids to a variety of stories that they might not be able to read or fully understand themselves yet but when you're reading it they're able to ask for a clarification for myself the bedtime stories of my father was something that i i literally used to be waiting for bedtime you know because it meant and there was always that one more just one more story um mm-hmm. and it was just wonderful you know because the stories that we read at bedtime i wasn't not allowed but they didn't stay with me the books so i couldn't read them during the daytime so i had something to look forward to you know um so that that was really um and i think i think people should i did read i did read extensively to the children in my life and they have all turned out all three of them have turned out to be voracious readers uh subsequently as teens and children but also as adults so it works i think if you're willing to put in a little bit of time and work it works yeah um ashraful islam is asking us when you think you're going to write a story do you choose the plot first or the characters you've talked about this that you mm. you're usually led by your characters and your narrator i think um, i think just to be sorry. just to be clear though what usually happens is that idea does come first it's something okay. triggers off you know the what if and then when i say what if somebody answers from the void and that is the character and that's uh, so the plot probably vaguely the plot comes first but it's followed very quickly by the storyteller who is the protagonist other character um to return to fragments for a bit um mm-hmm. how do you respond to the stories being interpreted in a different way that differs from what you thought they were about especially now because so many people are revisiting fragments after many years now and as you mm-hmm. said some of the stories were not as critically appreciated initially but now they're being um appreciated yeah, and vice versa so mm. what is that well, for you. Yeah, I think I'm less for me the fact that it's coming to people 8 or 9 years later is less of an issue because I think it's always about the individual reader and the individual mm-hmm. story. So, it, you know, whether they come to it now or whether they come 10 years later, that would not be the key factor for me. They might have 10 years more of experience or 10 years less to judge the story, but that that's a very minor thing for me. I think it's more just a question of um, you know, when they read it, how does it make them feel like you gave your own example of how it made you feel i'm sorry it made you feel that way but no, it was you know a good thing. It, was, it was just very <laughs> unexpected <laughs> so i think a lot of people um you know sort of bring to it and for me it's it's uh usually i hear from the people who have who the story has meant something to for people who hate the story there's very little to say except i'm sorry you hate the story you know i mean that yeah. everybody has their own tastes and preferences and I I totally understand that there's always that risk when they start the book that they won't like it. Um it's nice if people can be courteous and explain to you why they didn't like it, but even that is not a given. You know, they they took the book, they'll make of it what they will. Uh for the people who who do actually um find something meaningful, I love hearing what it is that they found meaningful. I in fact recently one of the bookstagrammers wrote to me at 2 a.m. I I am a night bird anyway. but wrote to me to him said so sorry that i'm disturbing you but i really needed to tell you i just finished reading getting there and this is what it made me feel and it made her feel quite a lot and um it was it was such a privilege for me you know i thought wow it, it's just something 
you know, I mean, I would, to be honest, I, as I've told you, I would have to write these stories whether anyone was reading them or not, because I write them in order to clear my own head. Otherwise, it's kind of like carrying around your undisposed of garbage in your brain, uh, which is not a wise idea. But um, it is wonderful when people read it and it means something to them. And it's fascinating what it means. I had someone write to me from the UK and she had she she'd chosen getting there as her first chapter of her PhD. So she said, you know, I, I did it. I know I was, I, she said, I did an interpretation of the story. I would like you to read it and tell me what you think. So I said, sure. And she sent it. And it was very interesting what she'd written. But what was also very interesting was she she chose the fact that Leila is an architect, the protagonist is an architect and leaves her home in Chittagong to move to Dhaka and create a new life for herself. She took architecture as the metaphor for building a new life. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating to me. I certainly didn't do that consciously. You know, in fact, my intern, whom I was very fond of at that time, uh, the intern at that time, and who's now one of my beta readers, um, she is an architect. So basically, I've been hearing a lot about architecture. And that's probably why Lela became an architect. And I also thought it's one of the things that you might get a job in, in Dhaka for, you know, there are firms and so on. So that was really interesting. But I thought, oh, I didn't think of that as rebuilding, rebuilding her life. You know, it's, it's just, but it works, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting to me when, when people say something, especially when they see something in it that I hadn't entirely intended. Or, or the danger is, of course, people think that all the stories are about you. And I want to say very clearly that it, you know all the stories are never about us, because if they were about us, we'd run out of stories very quickly. But I think what is true is that when you read someone's writing, you learn a lot about the person, you know, from what they're writing, um, which you might not even know if you just met them and had a casual conversation. Mm -hmm. I think it's very telling what comes up there. Um, have so, you yes, sent any? Sorry, I keep cutting you oh, off. No, so I was just saying that, you know, so when readers want to want to say something, I'm I. It's a privilege for me to hear it. I'm really interested. Sorry, go ahead. Have you sensed any change in the kinds of readers that are? Um, being drawn to fragments now that you know it has sort of resurfaced. Um, I think I think that's a loaded question, Sarah. I mean, it <laughs> is, I, I think it's a younger demographic, and the reason that yeah. this came about was because I was thinking that there are avid readers I know now between the ages of, in fact, the youngest I know is sixteen, but let's say between the ages of nineteen and twenty-five, and when fragments came out very few of them would have been old enough to pick up a book like that. Some I'm sure might have, but you know, the majority wouldn't. So even though it's just a few years, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to see if, if and, and I've been very, very grateful and very delighted by, by the response. So there is a, a younger demographic that's now interested, but to be fair, when I was writing Food for Thought, the column for uh, Star Magazine, there was also a younger demographic then. And I think you hear more from them because they are the ones who are brave enough to contact you on Instagram or Facebook or, yeah. you know, somebody my age, 10 years younger, will think twice, will never send a friend request, unlikely to send a friend request before writing a note saying, I am so-and-so, could I, you know, be added? So for me, it's always easier if somebody does write two lines about why they're writing to me because there are so many so many people out there who write for so many reasons um, that often what happens is I, my Facebook requests just keep piling up and I don't have the time to sort out and see who is a reader, who is not a reader. So it's, you know, whether they met me at a conference or uh, through my development work life or through my translation life, it's, it's nice to know uh, before I'm required to accept the friend request. I'm a dinosaur, okay, such is life. <laughs> um, to return to the idea of, you know, sending your stories out into the world, as you say, uh, let me just look at some of the questions. Okay, so I wanted to ask you if you send these stories out to convey any particular kind of message, or what is it that you're sending out into the world with your stories? Hmm, I think this goes back to what I was saying about, you know, when you write something, I don't, I don't believe in writing didactically in the sense that I think it backfires. If even if you believe very passionately about something, unless you're, it's better if you're a nonfiction writer or you're a journalist yeah. in a way, or a columnist, that's where you can put forward those views and people will. I think with literature, people come with an expectation for something that's moving or entertaining or interesting and not lecturing. So mm -hmm. I don't write the stories from, I want people to do this kind of point of view. You know, I want you to be like this. But I do write the stories um, about things that I wish people would think about more, maybe, or something that maybe they haven't encountered. And I would I would like to bring to their attention, you know, like, we all have children in our lives. Are we listening to them? 
That's an easy example, you see. But I, I can't say, please go and listen to the child in your life. I don't think anyone's sitting there waiting for Farah Ghaznavi to lecture them on how they should be living their lives. So I think with the writing, I, I have certain beliefs about, you know, I believe that you should treat everyone decently, regardless of their background or any, any other differentiating factor. I believe that you can't always like people, but you can always be courteous. Um, and these are the things that, that I, I hope are somewhat because for example maybe one of the stories would not necessarily consciously but let's say somebody who's darker skinned in bangladesh which i have been for most of my life especially i've been running around in the sun for my de development work and i've had colleagues i come back to the came back to the office and one of them memorably said and he is a nice guy said we're ah, african and what luck to you know <laughs> and very reached, in bangladesh. yeah which is of course very derogatory in bangladesh right yeah. and i said that's okay nelson mandela is one of my heroes I got no problem with that, you know? But I know that he found it very strange that I wasn't bothered. You know, I was like, you know, kind of thing. Um, but so, but a lot, when I was younger, it hurt me a lot because my dad is very fair skinned. And so whenever I was going anywhere with him, he would be like, you know, and he never understood. He still doesn't. So he'd be like, hi, Tamarbe, you know, very happily. And I'm like trying to, God, make the earth crack so that I can fall <laughs> to the center of it and not have to listen to this stuff, you know? So yeah. there is some of that. But, you know, think about what you say, maybe. Or I think the single thing I, I maybe want to do with the writing is to make people think a bit more about empathy. Because everyone has their struggles, you know, even the people that we don't like have their struggles. And it doesn't kill us to, to think a little bit about that rather than just be reactive or go with the, the flow. You know what I mean? Like, uh, even if you think it, you don't have to say it. You don't have to say every single thing you think. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, and that's also, I mean, that's name you mentioned a little while ago. We, we did work on something recently. And they're also saying, you know, like, for young boys and girls in in countries where there is a high you know high level of gender inequality, put yourself in the other person's shoes. How does it feel to have the entire burden of your family expectations on you if you're a boy? You know there are no excuses for ever you know failing if you're a boy. And think of how it is to be just as talented, just as intelligent, just as interested in the opportunities the world has to offer if you're a girl, and yet you can't do it just because you're a girl and you come from a certain kind of family. I think. If we come from a place of empathy, um, we understand other people a lot better. And I think we make our lives a lot easier also. So that would maybe be one of the underlying values. I would hope that the diversity of the, sh the stories would, would make people think a little bit about other people without othering people, if that makes sense. I love what you said on Tasneem's video for Books and Triggers. I watched it yesterday, and which I think is a wonderful series. It's called Smash the Patriarchy, being put together by uh, Books and Trick. And I completely agree with everything you said on that video. Um, on that note, do you think, do you have any favorite authors or books who do this thing particularly well, you know, in, who inspire empathy without being didactic? Um, I think any favorite authors I have would not be didactic. Because like everybody else, I don't like yes. being lectured. Yeah. But um, one of my favorite authors is a South African uh, writer called Andre Brink. He's a very, very well-established writer. And he wrote a particular book that was set in the a few hundred years ago, basically. Because, of course, apartheid only ended <laughs> in very recent memory, uh, which is a system of keeping people apart by race. So um, he wrote the story about a group. It's called A Chain of Voices. And it's he did such a fantastic job of putting you in the shoes of each person who was speaking, which is, I think, maybe what we all aim for, that you you really, you know, you understand where the protagonist is coming from, even if they're not like you, you know? So he wrote this wonderful book called A Chain of Voices, which I haven't reread recently, but I loved, loved when I first read it a few years ago. Um, another book that I think is very underrated, but I also love, um, and, and has these messages that you're talking about, I think, but very subtly, is Chimamanda Adichie's Purple Hibiscus. A lot of people talk about her subsequent writing, and it, she's brilliant. But that particular book, Purple Hibiscus, somehow is both very evocative and very relatable to me. And yet it doesn't reflect at all my family or my surroundings. So I think that's a very gifted writer can do that to you. You know, um, Another one is Elif Shafak, who is Turkish. And um, my favorite among her books is um, Honor and 
the the 40 rules of love which i think are just she's i'm not even going to go on i could just fangirl about her for the next 10 minutes without taking any breath um and absolutely sort of beats everything across the board favorite is uh rubindranath thakur's golpagutsu because i grew up reading and rereading those stories uh his novels are also brilliant but something about the way he writes short story and the way he uses language there is a line from chuti i think about this teenage boy who's very alienated and living with his uncle and miserable and says oi boy she choto choto kotha paka sorry paka kotha jathami choto choto kotha adho adho kotha hocche nakami paka kotha jathami ebong kotha bola matroi probol kotha so you know at that age as a teenager you know if you speak if you try to speak in a cute fashion it's really annoying if you if you try to speak in a very adult fashion then you're just you know you you need to be slapped down because you're not old enough to pull it off and in fact talking at all is a provocation so just, you know just shut up and in that one <laughs> sentence he's conveyed so much about the awkwardness of teenage life and of how you're seen by the people around you so um so yeah i never get tired of rereading those stories so those are some of my them there are so many but these are some of my favorites Do you have any favorites from this year or from this summer? I was going to ask you this but Nahia and I mean I think he's one of the authors from Gold from the Golden Anthology yes. if I'm not wrong. He has yeah. also asked us what what are some books that you are reading this summer? Okay, the thing is I don't actually read books uh as in the current books to be read not not for any reason except that I have such a huge TBR list that I'm invariably trying to dig my way out from under that so the new books will go into the TBR list but they won't, probably won't get reached as quickly um so and also I tend to read authors that might be a little bit obscure because I'm very interested in characters so like mm-hmm. one um I read um I read a a story about it's set in a very ordinary suburban american setting called um and I now like this writer very much her name is Jessica Strawser S T R A W S E R and the book I think is called Not that I could tell which is actually I I hate books which don't have memorable titles because I always have trouble um you know recommending them but this one does have a you know a very subtle meaning which is somebody goes missing and everyone is asking questions and so not that I can tell is sort of like well you know this happened but not that i could tell at the time that's basically where it's coming from which is i think a uh, quite a clever way to put it so i like that book very much there are others it depends on which um, oh there's a book by um peter swanson uh, who writes mainly thrillers but and this book is 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 somewhat thrilling but it's not only a thriller it's also fantastic character development and it's called before she met him this is what i mean about titles that you can't remember before he met her before she met him no before she met him i think is the name so those are two books that i would i would strongly recommend i'm about to begin reading um indubala bhater hotel which i'm very much looking forward to so that's the next item on my uh, on my list um elif shafak's new book as is actually out yeah, now really. yes it can yeah, wait on this one is going to go straight to the top of the tbr yeah <laughs> yeah and it's it's already um at one of the local bookstores i think so oh, i was just very yeah uh-huh. i think it was uh, okay. bd culture and books if i'm not wrong it came up on my feed okay. just before Thank i was you. logging in okay so I'm very excited uh we yes. have a lot of questions from audience members we can i think go through them um maisha islam is asking us why did you write fragments of river song how difficult was it for you to select the stories hmm Well I did of course I didn't write fragments of river song as a book because it's a short story collection so I wrote the stories one by one and some of them are stories that I wrote in the earlier part of my writing uh, experience and some came later um I decided it was very difficult to select the stories it was very difficult I tried to go for a cross section because I was trying to also see how far I could get across my own desire to be um not cross cutting but to be diverse in in the writing styles and Uh, products that i come up with the stories that i come up with so for fragments i decided that i would have six full length stories and my length of stories is longer than most people's i prefer to write about 7000 words and if i feel that it needs to be cut down i will to 5000 but 5000 day amar hoyna so i've been told that this is basically an indicator ritu uh, said to me that um uh, of kali said to me that i should take this as a indicator that i'm meant to write long form but i'm too scared to write long form so <laughs> i write very long short form instead anyway so i it was finding six stories that were like more regular length and then i took six pieces of flash fiction and i interspersed them which is why i always ask that people take breaks in between the stories but um so there is no 
there's probably no single thread going through Fragments of River Song. The idea for that book came to me as, you know, I thought of Bangladesh as some kind of gigantic mosaic, you know, and these are just 12 fragments which represent a few people's stories. Um, and the river song basically came from the idea that in the old days, the Mathis used to be on the river, the boatmen would sing Bhatiyalis, and these songs had drew a lot on the culture and stories of uh, Bangladesh. And now, of course, there are no Mathis singing these songs, I fear. So the, the writer is more like, the storyteller is more likely to be hunched over a keyboard in Dhaka or Kulna or wherever. Um, but that's why, you know, the, there's still the lingering fragments of river song in my, my head. And then the cover of the book also shows, it's, if you tilt it, I it's was, the Bangladesh map. Yeah. It's a really good job of, sorry. No, it's Monon Mon Moshi. He was amazing. Yeah, Mon Daily Daily Daily. Daily. He was, he was just, oh my God, such a joy to work with. And that was the third iteration because the first one he had like very still figures. I said I wanted them to be, you know, joyous and mobile and, and it wanted it to be colorful because Bangladesh with all its problems is a very vibrant and beautiful country also. And that doesn't come across always. So the idea was to put that, um, make it visible on the, co uh, the cover as well. Um, so. We have a somewhat related question from Habiba Mahmuda. She's asking us, how did you come up with the title? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, that one, that's as I just explained. I mean, fragment, the fragments, came, it came from two ideas. One was the, who is the storyteller for Bangladesh? In the old days, I was thinking of the fish, uh, the boatmen and the, the songs of the river. Uh, a lot of people have asked me about Doctor Who, and I have no idea what that reference is. I didn't know any river song there. I was, in fact, worried that I was making up a word for this title, which didn't exist. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so that's where the river song comes from. And all that's left of that river song are fragments. But Bangladesh is a very vibrant kind of mosaic, and it has millions and millions of stories. And these are just 12 fragments from that gigantic mosaic. But hopefully to show how rich our culture and our lives and our people's stories are. Do you have a favorite from the book? Oh. Is, it, is it like choosing a favorite child? It really is. It really is. Some are better behaved than others, of course. But um, no, it's funny. I asked this question to Andre Brink because I wanted him to say chain of... I met him in, in London. He was doing a reading in Hampstead, uh, the bookstore. So I asked him and he looked at me probably just the way I have looked now, unfortunately. And he said, they're like my children. I can't choose. I was like, no, but if you had to, if you had to. <laughs> and I wanted to, I was supposed to choose the one that I liked best. So he chose a couple which were not the one that I liked best. I don't have, um, I think I don't have a particular favorite. I have stories that it might sound funny, but I'm a little grateful for like getting there because I've had so much attention because of that story. And those characters are very dear to me. And a lot of people said to me that, um, you know, would you... Um, what what happens next and i'm like nothing happens next it's a short story but yeah. um they so many people have said this that it's actually I've, I've i've started wondering what would what might happen next but um actually i think uh big mother boroma is is one of my favorites also because um with that story i felt very much for the character she's entirely fictional but um and i wanted I wished her well. I wanted her to be okay. She stayed. She has stayed with me much longer than many of the other characters in the stories. You know, some are, some just go off fully fledged into the world, but Lali kind of lingers. So I don't know. That's a story. Even when I finished it, I thought, oh, there's more in this story, but I don't know how to write it right now. I don't know if I ever will know. But um, that's that's one favorite, I think I would say. And um, it's been fantastic to see Mosquito Net Confessions get this much attention because it didn't. I think there were one or two reviewers that pointed it out. I was lucky with my reviews even the first time around, but mostly. But um, that didn't get a lot of attention. In fact, one of my very dear friends, who's also a writer, said, "Well, I mean, this is hardly your best work." And I thought, "No, but it's not terrible. But it's wonderful <laughs> because you see, so many people seem to seem to relate to those characters." So. Um, yeah, so I think I, so. I think also actually maybe mosquito net confessions, and the last two would be guava tree rebellions because I, I like those characters and yeah. it's sweeping the mirror because it just haunts me. I wouldn't say it's my favorite story, but it, it's a story that yeah it haunts me. So I'm sorry that's very many answers, but but um, it's the truth. <laughs> different stories for different reasons. Yeah. Um, I have a question related to this. Do you, since I wasn't a part of Daily Star Books at the time, I think Rifat Bhai was in yes. charge at the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you tell us about your uh, decision with with the sequence of stories, which is something I'm always interested in? Was there any particular reason why you curated it this way? Um, I think 
it was very hard, actually. I'm still not sure that I got it right, because I think what often happens is that people will... I tried to put stories that were not similar next to each other, because I wanted people to know that if they disliked one story, they might like the next one. If they liked one story, they may or may not like you know, one after, but then read it to the end, because even the 12th story, Guava Tree Rebellion, I think is the, the note I chose to end on, which is quite a happy story, because um, I didn't want to end on a sad note, if that makes any sense. There's some stories which are, have some harrowing uh, bits, bits to them. Um, I chose Getting There as the first story because I felt that that was, in a way, one of the easiest stories to read. And it had been most curated and most uh, feedbacked um, upon. And so I thought, OK, let me go. In a way, it was a, a safer choice. I had, a, I had someone, Rita Shabnam Nizami is this wonderful writer, translator and um, She's an academic in the US. And she contacted me from SUNY Stony Brook to say that she wanted to include some of the stories uh, from, uh, from Lifelines in their curriculum, which was, of course, tremendous honor, uh, international literature curriculum. And getting there turned out to be one of the stories, but it was not her first choice. She chose the other ones first, and then I thought, oh. And then she came back by herself and said, OK, I want this one too. So I was very happy. And at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the semester, the students were, and they were very well-known, Jhumpa Lahiri and other people, you know, like really well-known, those kinds of people were on that uh, course. So she'd allowed people the choice at the end to write about one character that they related to and why. And it didn't have to be like, you know, it could be anything. So to my amazement, several people, and she was kind enough to send me the file, chose um, getting there. And that was also very interesting, going back to one of the things you said about readers and how they see things. So I'm guessing most people on that course were quite young. And for her, the, the, the one that I most remember, the young woman who responded, said, I don't know anything about Bangladesh. I don't even know anything about any of this. But her relationship with her father is very familiar to me. And that's why I like this. And she chose, interestingly, she chose the teenage niece, not the protagonist. They both have difficult relationships with their father. And that was very interesting for me because it was one of my earliest realizations that, oh, a reader takes what they're going to. This is a young person reading it, and she relates to the teenager in it. So, yeah, uh, it, was, it was a difficult thing. But I started with getting there for that reason, that I hoped that people would, even if they didn't like the story, would at least give the rest a chance, wouldn't immediately say, I hate this book and hurl it as far away as possible. And I ended with Guava Tree Rebellion because I thought it was a reasonably sweet, reasonably happy story, and many of us have grandparents whom we remember fondly or are lucky enough to still have around us and we might relate to it. And in the middle, it was just, I tried to make one or two stories which were very sad, bookended by less sad stories so that you weren't left feeling really low. But that's about uh, well, it. We've been talking for over an hour now and you know, time has really flown fast. Um, I think we can take just a few of the audience questions and then end with something that I want to ask you about what you're working sure. on now. Um, Tasneem has another question. She's asking us, what's your opinion on reading graphic novels and manga uh, compared to regular prose? I think people should read whatever they want. I grew up reading comic books and everybody thought, and I'm not I'm passing judgment on the Archie comic books, but everybody thought Marvel was the same as Archie, which it's not. And when I read the X-Men and I got a huge lecture from my mother for collecting them at that point, they were not cool. There were no movies at that stage, but they, it was Chris Claremont's run and they were brilliant. Brilliant story. I learned, actually, he's been a huge influence on my storytelling, I think, how to manage multiple characters. And and my my father, who's much less judgmental, as I said, about reading, finally said to me, can you, not, can you just not spend all your money on these things? Because, you know, it's driving your mother mad. And so I said, OK, we, let's talk about this. So I went back to the, the stack and I picked out some words and I came to him with a list of five words. And I said, this is what my vocabulary is because of Chris Claremont's X-Men. How many of these words do you know? And my father's very, he's very um, well-read, but there was one word in there that he didn't. I think one was arcane, one was, they were good words, you know? So I said, so please don't, please don't lecture me about <laughs> what I'm reading, you know? So therefore I feel that, you know, if, um, I think people should be encouraged to read anything, to be honest, because I think the reading habit is what's important. And then I think later they will, their tastes will mature and they will perhaps end up reading something that you approve of as a parent or a sibling or, you know, uh, friend, which uh, they came to themselves, you know, so why not manga? I, I, it's not a genre I read, but I think it's a very, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of style to write manga. Graphic novels I've, I've read and I've loved uh, the X-Men graphic novels early on. So yeah, you know, maybe, maybe for a phase, it's all you read. Maybe, maybe somebody who finds it difficult to read, finds it easier to read with pictures. I don't think we have to be too judgmental, you know, and yeah. 
unless it's really trashy literature, and you know, even that is very subjective. What is trashy literature? You know, if if, the, if it's not grammatically incorrect, it doesn't have to be considered trashy. If it's grammatically incorrect, I think I draw the line there. It's going to teach you how to speak the wrong way or write the wrong way. Yeah. That I would rather avoid. That and also, I think stories that perpetuate toxic tropes and toxic behavior. Yes, it's fine to read it as long as you know, mm -hmm. as long as you're reading consciously and you know know what yeah. you're reading. Yeah, actually. You're right. In fact, that is what I would put in trash. It can yes. be well, it can even be well written, but it's not good for your brain, you know, to to dwell on these kind of things. And I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Toxic tropes are best avoided. And if you're going to, you know, that people say you should read everything. I don't think you should read everything. I think if you can avoid reading garbage, then all the better for you. You know, go straight. There's too many books. We'll never finish reading all the brilliant yes, books in the world. So it makes me sad, you know? So <laughs> uh, if you can avoid that, then do it. But if, if it's just a phase that you're going through and it's harmless, um, then why not? Um, Mursalin is asking us, have you ever forbidden your child from reading any book, perhaps because you thought they weren't ready or the content repelled you? Or did it happen to you when you were a child, uh, which you've just, I think, answered? Yeah. Um, would you like to elaborate on it or? Yeah, very, very quickly. I think, um, no, I didn't forbid my child from reading anything, but I made sure that she had access to things which were good and interesting and never let her run out of those things, frankly. So, you know, I don't think it was before she was a teenager that she started reading, um, um, the child in my life started reading things that were, you know, maybe more problematic. And if something was particularly dire, I just gave her a heads up. You know, I said, you know, you can, but it's garbage and it's not true. And you shouldn't base your idea of relationships or anything else on this. This is not not healthy. Um, so, yeah, that's about as far as I went. But I did I did make a very conscious effort with all the kids in my life, including friends, kids that I've been friend, you know, part of raising to to really you know, kind of swamp them with wonderful books. And luckily, there are only 24 hours in a day. So that took care of most of it, I think. I'm sure they've read some things that they shouldn't have, but not thanks to me. Um, one final question from Rakib Hassan. He's asking us, if you have any advice for nonfiction writers, what do people need to do to become hmm. a nonfiction writer? I don't want to be presumptuous in that sense. I, I can't really give advice to writers, let alone non-writers, but um, because I think it's a very individual journey. I think you can. My suggestion would be that you read up a lot on the craft of nonfiction, because I think you don't have to have a degree. I, do, I am a self-taught writer. I don't even have a degree in English literature. Forget about an MFA, right? So I think you can write if you want to. Uh, but I think what really makes uh, a writer very good is how much they've also read in their lifetime. Uh, avid readers, I think, tend to make better writers with or without uh, formal formal skills. And if you can get the formal skills, you know, good for you. But I think there's a lot of um, material out there on the craft of writing, as well as writing fiction and nonfiction. So I would head out and look for that. And I think the other thing is, and this I feel about fiction also, I think there is a tendency, particularly from writers from the periphery, um, so-called periphery, when we write things, there are, Chimamanda Adichie did a wonderful TED talk on this, the single narrative, that we are expected to write stories. And, and that I, I really hate, and I'm not going to do with any of, any of my work. Either you like it or you don't like it, but I'm not gonna change it to make it more easily palatable or fit a certain South Asian trope, you know, monsoon wedding, elephants on the street, whatever it is, right? So um, I think, think about your authenticity when you write, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, that is a very important value to me, that it's not that it has to have happened, but it it has to be, you know, it has to be believable. It has to have been able to have happened, if that makes any sense. And for nonfiction, of course, that's even more true. It, it's nonfiction, it must ring true. Even creative nonfiction must ring true. I think most readers are aware when you are padding something or you are exaggerating or you're bringing in something a little bit sensationalist to be interesting. You don't have to be sensationalist to be interesting, I believe. So that's the one piece of advice I'd give. And the second piece is please read up on the craft because I think there are amazing, amazing writers out there writing about how to write nonfiction. I think that that's very helpful advice. Um, do you want to take the last question? We have one final one sure. from Habiba Mahmuda again. She's asking us, did you ever read a book and on instant want your child to read that too? Um, then and what, what book was that? Yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> More than one, in fact. But the two I'm going to mention is um, The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe from the Narnian Chronicles and The Wind in the Willows. And I wanted my child to read this long before I had a child. 
So <laughs> I want everyone's children to read this, among many, many others. Question, what would, is, what would we want our child, non-existent child to read? But, but did you not think this? Because I, I actually had a reading list for my non-existent child. So, um, and, and I just want to give a shout out to a new book that's out, which I think uh, is worth a look at, particularly for parents with young children. It's called Bawiwela. Um, and it was featured in the Daily Star Books page uh, last Thursday. And I think it's I think it's a wonderful book. And I think people who have young kids might want to take a look and see what they think. I'm preparing to buy copies for everyone I know with young kids. So, I think uh, actually Moira Punky publishers are doing really good work with, mm. with children's books. And they're so beautiful as well, in addition they're to so being beautiful. You know, well written. Um, I, we, I think we can wrap it up now, but I do want to ask you, I know some of what you're working on, work, uh, working on now, but mm. can you tell us about what your future plans are, what you're working on, what are you writing? Okay, my future plans tend to get sidelined by life on a regular basis, which is why it's Fragments was 2013. But I have the manuscript for the second short story collection ready in draft. I need a few months to edit it, but between pandemic and kind of household responsibilities. I haven't had those couple of months. I have, however, managed to write some stories which have gone out in singular anthologies, like as singulars in anthologies, like Golden. And then there's like, Nia Zaman. Yeah. Nia Zaman is bringing out a book called When the Mango Tree Blossomed, which is with Nymphia Publications, I think in the next month or two. And um, so there are there are perhaps three. And there's, there's the best short stories, best Asian short stories 2020. So these are new stories of mine, which have not appeared in Fragments of River Song, four new stories that are about to be published or just have recently been published and in this new collection i have a title working title for it and i just need to have some time to finish the stories and my aim is actually to try i'm a development worker by day so my aim is to try and move more to like non-literary translator jobs for this time because the translation allows me to focus creatively on the on the um, short stories or you know the creative work so i hope i hope and pray that that will be out before next year this time let's put it that way and uh, I'm also training to be a therapist. <laughs> so hopefully also next year, this time I will have a new hat to be wearing. So quite a lot, quite a lot on the plate at the quite moment. A lot. Let's see how it. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And I think that's a wonderful note to end it on. Thank you so yes. much, Farapa, for, for making time for us. I know you have a lot on your, uh, on your plate these days, but it's been wonderful planning this whole thing with you. It's always wonderful talking to you about books usually at night it usually yes. happens yes. after midnight yes. <laughs> That's my free that time <laughs> yeah um no. so, well thank you and is there anything you'd like to say to your readers no i would like to say thank you very much sarah for organizing this and for working with me on it beforehand at ungodly hours of the of the morning <laughs> um i really appreciate that um and the way that you you handle work in general and for anyone who's showed up to be part of this program, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of what is undoubtedly a very busy day. For me, it, it's just a pleasure actually to talk to book lovers. Uh, I've said that, you know, it's, it's like coming home when you hang out with other people who um, you may not know them at all. They may not like the same books, but if they like books, that's good enough. So thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, everyone else who's here. And Farhan also, thank you. Um, to our viewers watching,